My name is Tanya Nelson and I am chair of ICOM UK and I'm delighted to welcome you to our annual conference, Working Internationally. Uh, this year, the title of our conference is Shifting Landscapes, Shifting Perspectives. Um, and certainly over the last year, a lot of things have shifted and a lot of perspectives have, have changed. Um, uh, it was actually on March 12th when we had our last uh, Working Internationally conference. We had it at Leeds Arts Gallery. Um, and it was, I think, two days before uh, the, the border shut down and the first lockdown. And I, when I'm thinking about it, I mean, it was a wonderful day where we really had a chance to really explore some really interesting issues. Um, but I remember taking a very crowded train from London to Leeds with no mask, <laughs> no social distancing. I can't imagine that now. Um, and I think from an ICOM point of view, we really are excited about the fact that despite all the challenges that COVID has brought to us, um, an opportunity we have is to um, is to be able to do this conference remotely with with many more um, people involved over a three day period. We would usually have a conference um, of of one day, um, so it's incredibly exciting to be kicking off this conference, um, which has you know a theme. Today's theme is going to be around social justice. Tomorrow we're going to be exploring museums and sustainability. Um, and finally, we're going to be discussing the future of museums. So I think we've got a lot of great content coming to you over the next uh, couple of days. Um, before we start, I just wanted to take an opportunity to one, go over some um, housekeeping. Um, so just in terms of this webinar, a couple of things I want to note. Um, the format means that your cameras and mics should be on mute. So if you could just please, um, could you know, please just make sure you have your um, your cameras and mics uh, off. Um, you can access the professional closed caption um, for the session by clicking on the CC closed caption button um, in Zoom in the Zoom panel at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can post questions to speakers using the Q and A function. Um, apologies if we can't get through all of your questions, but we'll do our best. Um, you can use the chat function to introduce yourselves. And I see people are already doing that. So that's fantastic um, where you work um, and you can chat with other uh, folks who are in the conference. Um, just please note that everything in the chat will be saved and made publicly available. So don't post anything that you don't wanna share publicly. Um, and finally, we will have someone from ICOM UK available in the chat to answer any technical questions you may have. So that's it with the housekeeping. The second thing I really wanted to do before launching in is to thank our partners. Um, we've been working with NMDC um, on this conference for many years, and we've been supported by British Council um, to deliver this conference each year. Um, but I'm really excited to say that we've had curatorial support from Barker Langham, um, which I think is really going to provide a rich and, and interesting angle to our conference. Um, they're an international uh, cultural consultancy, and we've really enjoyed working with them. So without further ado, um, I want to introduce our first session for today. Um, it is an in conversation. We really felt that it was nice to start with an informal conversation between two people. Um, and so we are going to have um, in conversation with us, Richard Benjamin, who is head of the International Slavery Museum in Liverpool, um, and Zandra uh, Yeeman, who is on secondment from the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights um, at the Hunterian Museum, where she is leading um, as curator of the Discomfort Project. Um, and so today they're really gonna be talking about how we can make some changes, um, shifts and changes in our sector from a social justice perspective. So I will now hand over to Richard Benjamin, who's gonna, gonna start um, our session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya. And, and thank you as well to Catherine and the ICON team for this, uh, this invitation. It's, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, uh, you shouldn't really start with apologies, but but I will start with one. If people think I'm looking in a very strange manner, it's because I've had some technical issues and, and my surface go is actually turned round the other way. So please bear with me uh, if you think I'm looking strangely. So uh, 
I'm going to pass you over to my friend and colleague Xander in a, in a few minutes who can introduce herself just a little bit uh, about me. Uh, so uh, Richard Benjamin, I've been head of the International Slave Museum here in sunny Liverpool uh, since 2006, so over 13 years now. And I appreciate that, that some of you will have been to the International Slave Museum in Liverpool and others may know nothing about it whatsoever. And uh, the reason I think I've been asked, you know, to, to say a few words and, and have a conversation, like I said, with a friend and colleague about some uh, very kind of important uh, issues that are ongoing within our sector is because the International Slave Museum has always been a museum that has very much classed itself as a museum that fights for social justice. And we've never seen ourselves as a as being a neutral space. And, and some of these discussions, for those of you that are in the sector, we know that are still raging today and are still ongoing. Uh, but we've always had quite a subjective view. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that's always been supported by colleagues within uh, National Museums Liverpool, of which we are one of, of several national museums. So it's a very large organisation, largest museums, set of museums outside of, of London. Uh, so over the years, ISM has had a very, I like to think, impactful exhibition uh, and set of uh, programmes. Uh, and we've got a very active uh, educational programme as well, looking at developing school resources around the subjects of the legacies of transatlantic slavery and indeed other sh issues which would come under the title of social justice. So uh, we're going to kind of hopefully some of those will, will, will come out in the conversation. So I'm going to pass you over to Zandra so she can tell you who she is and we can talk a little bit about how we met and maybe then get into a, a, a mildly interesting conversation. So over to you Zandra. Thanks Richard and thanks to ICOM for bringing us together in conversation, something that we do um, fairly regularly over the last few years. So it's quite interesting that we've been invited to do this in a public sphere. So, you know, as the introduction said, I'm Zandra Yeaman and I'm on secondment from an anti-racist organisation based in Scotland and the Coalition for Racial Equality Rights, working as curator of discomfort at the Hunterian Museum based at the um, University of Glasgow. And I suppose um, for the last 20 years, I've been involved in human rights and social justice, um, both as an activist, but also in a professional capacity. Um, and I've been very privileged to have that role, I have to say. And in the last 10 years, I'd been coordinating Black History Month in Scotland. And this is what brings me into the culture and heritage sector, really, was recognising um, the lack of uh, our history in, you know, our cultural and heritage spaces, including museums. Um, and I felt very strongly that these spaces are really, really important spaces for our society, particularly within social justice, to enable us to understand our history and how we are in the position that we're in in the present day um, to enable us to ch make changes for the future. So that's a wee bit about me. Zandra, just maybe give people an idea about kind of why we're actually kind of in conversation together and how we know one another. But but we met many years ago when you, uh, self and colleagues, used to come to Liverpool. Can, this might segue us into that broader discussion about what community is that we often yarn about for, for many hours when we do talk. Uh, yeah. A lot longer than an hour it often is. <laughs> uh, how did you, why did you come to Liverpool? And, and then what was that capacity? Well, one of the things that we used to do annually in October in Scotland was as part of Black History Month, we would bring people down to London from Scotland to actually come to your museum because there was no space in Scotland that actually told that story or um, made any connections to the transatlantic slave trade. And in 2007, uh, the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights um, hired a researcher to look at Scotland's links with the transatlantic slave trade um, because it was never something that came out in discussion. And we had started walking tours about our built heritage way back in 2001 um, because we felt that knowing this history was really, really important within the anti-racist movement. And my first connections with you was bringing groups of people from Scotland down to Liverpool um, to visit your museum. And then I remember it was around 2014, 
I literally just rocked up at your door um, um, to meet up with you because we were, were looking at organising a campaign in Scotland for a museum of empire, colonialism, slavery and migration. And you were great. I mean, you, 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 you didn't know who I was and, you know, we just kind of turned up and you um, kindly met with me um, because we were doing a lot of research around, well, what does Scotland need? So that was around 2014, Richard, actually, and you gave us a lot of really good advice. And then we launched the campaign officially um, for the museum in 2017, which obviously we've had you up in Glasgow speaking to our museum committee and you know, you've been very supportive of our work. Well, look, not at all. I, mean, I always thought it was a, a really interesting idea. And what, other than kind of, you know, getting on with yourself and, and, and your other colleagues, which which always helps when you people who maybe share you know experiences professionally and personally, and that's maybe one of the things we can we can talk about our own maybe backgrounds and, and, and views have, have shaped what we what we do. Uh, and interestingly, after you had been down to Liverpool those many years, I started going up to Glasgow quite a lot. Like you said, you invited me up to speak. And what was interesting for me was to see how there were a number of uh, of cities in the UK who were having discussions uh, like Liverpool had had. Maybe Liverpool had had them earlier. You know, we had a transatlantic slavery gallery since the early 90s. Uh, and there'd been a, a long, long history of community activism leading up to even having a gallery or something that spoke about the city's role in the transatlantic slave trade. So, you know, Bristol, London and Glasgow maybe hadn't... Uh, got to, to that place. Uh, but for me, the, the really interesting thing was museums often talk about communities and we have to listen to our communities. Uh, and we often talk, don't we, about what that means and it's actually different things for, for different people. So how do you see when we use the term community? Because you're now working within that museum field. Yeah. Has that it's, changed for you, your view on that? It's been interesting because I'm on the outside inside now so it's quite interesting all the conversations that I've been having over the last six months with museum professionals and when they talk about community and you ask them the question well what do you mean and I'll be quite honest you know it gets to the point where actually when they talk about community what they're meaning is black minority ethnic people and I think we have to be very careful when we approach community in that way because you're othering people um, and I think um what I see in Scotland anyway, what I see is a lot of short term projects that get set up and it's all a with a focus of diversifying their audience. Um, and I think there needs to be a lot more work to be done in that area. There has to be a lot more work um, when we look at well, what do we actually mean by community and who is the community that we're talking about? I think people just use that word and then they just think, it, oh, it's just like getting a group of people who are from a black minority ethnic background into the museum and have a conversation. But my concern always is where is the authority in those conversations? Is there, you know, what are the power relationships? You bring in people extrapolating knowledge, you know, there's maybe not even opportunity for payment. You know, there's a lot of kind of complexities around um any kind of community work um, and is it actually consultation is it coll proper collaboration you know is there is a real listening going on here you know what happens about managing expectations I mean you know Richard you and I talk about this a lot and we could actually fill the whole day just even discussing you know words like well, what does community mean and who is community and how do we find um, who are the people that we're, we're kind of talking about I think that's a really, really good point. I mean, before I became head of ISM, no one remembers this, including my colleagues in, in the museum here. So I, I don't know what that says about my, my efforts in the period. But for six months, I actually was the community consultation coordinator for the International Slave Museum and the Museum of Liverpool. And I kind of think in those days, it was about, you know, providing some tea and coffee, you know, going out there, meeting people, our audiences and... And this is the big thing, telling them what we were going to do. <laughs> it was kind of like, what do you think of that? Uh, and sometimes it was like, mm, OK, but equally it could be like, well, no, that's not something that, that, that we as a community in Liverpool feel as if speaks for us, speaks about our lives. 
so moving on, I've always been very aware of that, of, of the head of the museum, that there is a power kind of structure here. Uh, and you just hit upon it then. And for me, when we talk about, you know, community engagement, uh, you know, co-production and listen, there needs to be a change in the power structure. And, and a lot of us in the sector, and probably me included to a degree, will we'll probably find that quite hard to do that. So have you got any kind of, like you said, inside, outside, inside? Is there any things that you think we need to be aware of the, the pitfalls that could could happen if we don't shift those power relationships? I think one of the one of the things that I see is uh, there's a couple of things I suppose I could put forward is it's things like time scale, simple things like time scale. So you have you know you have a time scale to achieve something. But if you're working with community groups, um, you have to be flexible. You might not. You know, they're not going to always work to your time scale. Um, so there's that to consider. There's also this attitude as if you're giving something to people, you know, as if you're doing them a favour. There's always that kind of attitude that has to be can I address because why do people want to engage with museums in the first place? You know, what what benefit will they get out of it? You know, there's there's, there's issues around that that you've got to think about. I think there's definitely financial implications on people. Um, I think people should be recompensed for their time, um, for their expertise and their knowledge. Um, and I think there should be transparency and honesty. You know, when, when people are working um, with groups that we don't see as museum professionals, you know, there has to be some sort of equity in that room when you're working with people and, and equity around the um, who has the authority in the room? Where does that lie? Where does the power lie? It's not easy to give up power. I mean, I've done community engagement um, work pretty much throughout my whole life. And there is times when you're doing collaboration, you can get frustrated and you feel I would be just quicker doing it myself. But actually, you've just got to meet people where they are at on that journey and understand that they might not be in the place that you're at. So you have to take a bit more time to try and get everybody, you know, on the, on some sort of um, equitable um, level place where we're all trying to have open and transparent conversations. Yeah, I mean, again, you just, something there, you talked about expertise, and we were talking the other day, actually, maybe this is one thing we disagree on, maybe, there's not many, but maybe this is one, and you said to me, oh, you know, I'm not an expert, and I said straight, well, wait a minute, you know, you are an expert and I, was that because you kind of had, had been used to when you've engaged in the past with museums or people in the sector do, have you felt as if there has been this sometimes a, a bit of a barrier about who sees who as an expert or not because I would see you absolutely as a as an expert as I would with what we class as you know community partners because they're not you know this homogenous view of community there's historians you know, there's people who are activists, they're professionals, they're business people, that, you know, they give us our time, often without being paid, you're quite right there. So was that something you, you kind of have been made to feel or you genuinely thought, well, no, I'm not an expert? I think one of the reasons I don't like being called an expert is I feel that what happens, um, and, and I suppose our focus here is museums, I feel what happens is it negates people's actual personal responsibility to do this work. So let's call in the expert when actually everyone has a responsibility um, with regards to social justice within our society. You know, everybody has a responsibility to be anti-racist. You know, um, we all have a responsibility. So I always feel that when people call me an expert, I feel that's their way of saying, well, I can't do that. So you need an expert to do it. Um, when really all we're talking about is humanity. So it's more, it's it's not like an imposter syndrome or anything that I, I have. It's literally because I feel people use that as an excuse not to do the work. Yeah. Well, we, you just, so you've hit on something else there that we've, we've talked about regularly, uh, about anti-racism. And, and we know that there's a lot of, international and national narrative that museums and, and, and the sector is now engaging with you know, let's throw a couple out there you know black lives matter uh, and the response to that uh, and when we were talking the other day wasn't it we were we were talking about short-term and long-term commitments so should we talk a little bit about how we one 
can genuinely our sector of museums be truly anti-racist and actually what does it mean and what do you think people think it means to them so what's your take take on it I, I, I genuinely think museums can be anti-racist and, and the way to do that is to actually take a conscious effort to be anti-racist and the way to do that is also um, by acknowledging that racism actually does exist in the UK. So having that acknowledgement, because it's taken us so long um, even to get people to acknowledge, you know, racism exists. Um, and also understanding how multidimensional racism is, you know, there's there's overt racism that we can witness and, and we can clearly see what that is, but it's the, the covert racism that actually does so much harm to our society, to individuals, um, to our institutions. Um, and I think the starting point is A, acknowledging that exists and B, yes, there is ways where we can make conscious decisions to change that. And also not being afraid, because we live in a, 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 a society that is so afraid to actually tackle this head on. And sometimes we will make mistakes, but mistakes is where we learn. And one of the things that I've recognised around mistakes is people get defensive when a mistake's made, as opposed to thinking, well, actually, I did get it wrong there, so I'm going to be transparent about that, and it's how do I put it right? And I feel across the country, that's something all of us would benefit from. You know, we always focus on the positive work that we do, when actually, when we expose the mistakes we made and how we put them right, that's where the learning is. Yeah. Well, people, of course, are going to make mistakes. And it's not about castigating people, isn't it? I mean, you know, as an organisation, uh you know the venues and the people that work within them because of personal circumstances or professional will we'll be in different places you know different levels of understanding about what it means to be uh you know for instance anti-racist and some of us who were you know activists and who because of their personal backgrounds have, have had to be anti-racist are obviously in a different place for some people that, that haven't had to do that and we again in the sector we ban the term privilege around it it's a, it's a term used very uh, easily by by people as well and for me it's about making making people aware of what the issues are making people aware colleagues aware mm -hmm. of the different as you said the different levels and complexity of anti-racism i'm a firm believer that organizations can bring in practices they can develop strategies and charters and you know terminology documents and all those things we do at national museums liverpool i've been part of those myself particularly terminology documents mm -hmm. over the years and we have a, a black staff group of which you know i'm co-founder in 2007 and, and many colleagues have, have inputted into that so as an organization it's been on a journey and, I, and i'm pleased to say that now you know particularly with our you know our leadership team and, and director there's great support for us to to come continue this but one of the things i'm a firm believer in is that the emphasis still needs to be on the individual to go out there and find out what it is not to be fed all the information. What's your view? On, what's your view on that? If you, if you were you know, people on this, you were thinking, "Oh, it's a bit scary for me." What? Well, one of the things that I find interesting is, again, you know, being on the inside of museums and and in lots of conferences, and you know, I, I take part and I listen in. I feel strongly that museums focus very much on museum issues and not society issues, which I find quite interesting because. Who is it that actually, who, who are museum audiences? It's people from society who enter, you know, these spaces. Yeah. Um, and I feel that what people are looking for is a, re a recipe of practice within a museum, as opposed to well, educate yourself on what's going on in society, because we read newspapers. We don't always get great information from there. We, you know, as we know, we watch the news you know, we can read books. There's lots of different ways where we can actually um, find out what's actually going on in society and have a kind of critical view and, 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 and what we're exposed to. And I feel that's where the gap lies is us as individual practitioners and being able to take our humanity into our practice within these spaces. We seem to forget that we are implicit in the, the structures that currently exist and there's an interplay between the structure and us as individuals. Um, I was in a meeting the other day actually just talking this very thing about 
this group that wants to put forward recommendations to the Scottish Government. And I'm saying, well, you don't need to reinvent the wheel because all the recommendations already exist. You just have to look at all the research, you know, that has been done, for instance, with regards to anti-racism. There's plenty of research being done and recommendations being put forward and how to address racism. Um, so why not use that? Why not use with the information that's already out there as opposed to... Um, making up your own it just doesn't make sense to me well, i don't yeah. know if that answered your question but i just feel there's a focus there should be more focus on society societal issues than there is on museum issues and, and finding a way to bring them together well i think that's a bit this brings us to an interesting point and maybe people who are in the sector who are, who are on this will, will throw this out as well uh, sometimes i get a feeling that as a sector you know, when you start putting together, or it starts putting together, and that's a kind of fairly generic it, uh, sessions, workshops, conferences, uh, like I said, charter statements on on these issues. Sometimes there's a, there's a view that, it's, that, here we go, it's started now. Now we're really serious. And that sometimes forgets that there's been like, you know, generations of people who have been anti-racist activists. You know, decolonisation didn't start, you know, 12 months ago when people in the sector started talking about it. You know, Black Lives Matter, you know, it's not a moment. These are movements. These are movements. These are things, you know, we've been part of the movements and other probably people on this call have been part. And sometimes I think that can be a frustration for me. That, okay, the sector's ready now. Here we go. What's your, I mean, again, from the outside, inside, do you get that, do you get that sense? I, do, I mean, I feel very privileged in the situation I'm in because I am at a university museum. So there's, there's resources there, there's support from leadership. You know, because none of this stuff will work in museums if, if leadership doesn't back it, you know. And it doesn't mean it's perfect because, you know, I'm creator of discomfort. There's a lot of uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. But the point of that is that these conversations do not get closed down or they should not be closed down. And they're unfinished, you know. One of the issues going forward, I think, I mean, I, I have to stay positive, Richard. We have to, don't we? Because yeah. we've been around a long time and we've been part of movements for a lot. We've seen things spike and we get all excited and we think, now they're listening, now they're listening, it's going to happen. And then, you know, something else takes precedence and, you know, becomes the topic. Um, and then we get forgotten about again and we have to start from square one. But I really do think there is a change now. I have to say for the first time in 50 years, I think, I mean, in the, in the 20 odd years that I work professionally and the work I'm doing, I've not seen anything like this, to be honest. Um, so I really do think there's a real opportunity here for us to drive this forward together um, and to try and build some bridges of trust, yeah. um, you know, that can carry the weight of the truth that we're trying to deliver. Because all it is is about our history. I mean, that really is what it's about. Um, and I, I do I do think, I feel very positive about what's going on now, but one of the things that really has to be addressed is things around timescales. You know, short two-year projects are not going to achieve what we want to achieve. You know, this work has to be embedded within institutions. It has to come from the top. Um, there has to be clear leadership in going forward and um, doing this work um, because it's forever. Yeah, you know, it it's not going to come to an end, and then, well, that's it. We've done it. We've decolonized. That's great. It's it's not going to end like that. I wish it would, but it's yeah. not. There isn't. <laughs> yeah, there isn't. Like, hey, we've we've done it now, isn't it? And this is another thing that that we both chatted about, though, wasn't it? Was the longevity of well, a project end for a start of. I've always been someone. You, you projects, of course, can can take organisations forward, but they end. You know that 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 you know you have Gantt charts and that's it that that they're, they're finished. Uh, and in one sense, there are a lot of museums uh, and outside of the sector, there are a lot of organisations who are advertising research roles for six or nine months. For instance, in in the world that I'm living in, to for instance, to look at the history and the connection between the organisation and transatlantic slavery. Now, as we were saying, that that's something that's in one sense is embedded isn't it? it it's in the dna of an organization that and that doesn't mean it necessarily should stop mm -hmm. so i think 
you know, I mean, we've, you know, the Black Lives Matter statements online and in certain venues around the country. For me, in the next six months and 12 months, it's whether they're still there. Because, like I said, if they're taken down, people might move on. What do, you, what do you think we need to do then to make sure that they don't just take the panel down, that there's something left? Yeah, well, what's going to be interesting, I can speak for what's going on from an anti-racist perspective in Scotland. Every institution that put out a Black Lives Matter statement in Scotland, we have recorded that and we will be revisiting them in a year's time um, to see what they've done. So, you know, there's activists out there who are keeping an eye on that. Now, I know for some people a statement was a good thing. I, I can understand that for some people putting out a statement was what they felt strongly about doing. I'm not sure how, I, you know, I don't necessarily think a statement's enough and maybe it's because I'm old school. You know, I've, I've lived a life where there's been a lot of talk and a lot of statements being put out there, but actually what we need is action. So I'm quite um, cynical about statements, I have to say. I can understand that in some ways for an institution that seems like a big deal, but what I want to see is what are the changes that are being made. So on the one hand, I understand, yes, acknowledge that racism exists, acknowledge that actually you've been part of the problem, um, and, and clearly state, well, what are you going to do about it? Um, a lot of good work that I've seen over the years happens quietly, and the change comes, and people are, are, are doing that change. You know, it's quite insidious, and the change as, as I say, it's driven by leadership and it happens. Um, we don't always have to make a statement about it. So I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm expressing that right. Do you understand, Richard? Like I've seen over the years lots of statements, but I haven't seen any change. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 in one sense, I, it's like, uh, you know, friends and colleagues and, and uh, historians from Liverpool, who, when Liverpool made a, uh, the city made an apology for its role in the transatlantic slave trade, uh, there's two sides. It was like, well, okay, it's 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 positive that the you know I think still one of the only cities that's ever done that. But it's what you do, isn't it? I mean, it's, yeah. It, it, well, what did that apo what, did, what does that apology mean for people who are still um, on you know on the receiving end of, of racist perpetrators? What has that statement? What has that apology actually done? I can understand the symbolism of an apology. Yeah. But what we need, along with symbolism, is we need action and sustained action. And for that action to be sustained, it has to be something that's embedded in everything we do. You know, as I said, there has to be conscious um, efforts for change. And it's not easy. Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, I would say in Liverpool, I mean, there's too many examples to know. But one of the, uh, the changes, it was sadly because of a horrendous incident the racist murder of Anthony Walker uh, and the Anthony Walker Foundation in Liverpool I'm a trustee of that and they do marvellous work on educating people on on hate crime in the city and there's been you know support from uh, Liverpool City Council as well so for me uh, as a trustee and, and you often from the inside you realise how, how they, these organisations struggle financially and there needs to be long-term commitment and support for organisations in cities who tackle issues, for instance, around hate crime. That's a legacy of transatlantic slavery. So there are, you know, anybody here who's representing a city, one of the things I would say to you is, you know, find out who, what organisations are working in the field of hate crime or something like that, and, you know, <laughs> make sure that they've got longevity. Uh, on that period discussion, and again, we talked about this, didn't we, was, uh, is, there were those organisations, so the Hunterian, or, uh, uh, NML and, and other organisations that have people who have personal experience and professionals and who are able to help. They're not the the you know the oracles on everything, but they're able to help the the movement of the organisation. But the reality is, a lot of organisations and maybe a lot of independent museums, etc., they don't. So what do you? I mean, and, and I'm not saying I have the answer here whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Maybe someone gives me the answer in the, in the chat. Uh, but for those organisations that are still, I mean, the sector's not diverse and particularly inclusive still. We've got a lot of work to do generally. But for those museums that have that have no diverse staff, or no, have you got any kind of advice on what they do as a might do as a next step if they truly want to engage in some of the things we're talking about? I think we need to. I think organisations need to be very brave 
and this is where they can use the legislation to take positive action steps um, across the board with any groups that are underrepresented within um, you know, museums. Um, I think there's ways of looking at, well, how do you actually gain employment? I mean, there's lots of stuff out there that's actually really good. It's just that it's never followed through. So again, it becomes these projects are set up. I mean, I know that there's some good stuff happening um, where it is looking at bringing, you know, um, people through uh, to work within museums and become museum professionals, but not going through the usual route. So it's not about having to go to university to do a, a degree in museum studies. There's other ways that you can bring people um, into institutions. I mean, I'm one of them. I'm an example of it. You know, I'm an activist and I'm now working within a museum. So, you know, my background and my my qualifications are, are on citizenship and human rights. So there's other expertise that can be brought around the table. And there's also the issues around class. I mean, I I'm, I'm find it really interesting. I tick a few boxes, you know, being mixed race, being working class, you know. It, it can be quite intimidating being in these spaces when you have, when you come from a working class background, you know, when you're mixed race, it can be very intimidating. and. I think people and and uh, professionals need to be very aware of that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, you've just said then alluded to the fact we well, said this before that you know museums they need to be reflective of of society generally and the, the communities that are around them. And often that's difficult. You know, these are these are buildings that were were have never meant to be particularly accessible to you know the the rank and file members of the public. So it's mm -hmm. You know, it's hard when you're now trying to turn some of these quite imposing spaces into spaces that, are, you know, people want to actually go and visit. And we're having, uh, it's a big part of our own project. You know, we're, we're embarking on our, the next phase of our journey, major capital transformation project of, of the Slave Museum and the Liverpool Waterfront. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we the, the centre of that project is the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. building, which was the old Doc Traffic office. And it's an incredibly imposing building. So once we get the funding, what you do inside will be all those things we, we talk about. But actually getting people into it still, it's a really imposing building, you know, and getting people down to the Albert Dock, Royal Albert Dock, who have not tended to go there, particularly members of the black community in Liverpool. These are, these are hurdles, aren't they? Even getting people into the into the spaces. I think there should be value in, t in coming out of the space too. I think there should be just as much equal value about, um, you know, any outreach work that can be done, whether it's going into schools, you know, whether it's actually going into um, different community centres or, you know, there's lots of kind of things we can do to think outside the box. But I do think issues around employment within the sector is very important. And, also these short-term projects who are who are in these short-term projects because that would be an interesting study because I think especially with what's been going on now you will find there probably is an increase of black minority ethnic people working within culture and heritage but it will be short-term projects yes yes it's not it, it needs to be that commitment for long term isn't it I mean look we we know the sector is not diverse but there's a lot of us who, who are working towards that but as I often say to people, and, and, and we have an equality, diversion and, and inclusion group at NML, which is, again, is a positive move, but it's about having inclusive practices. So even if there were full time and permanent roles for members of the black community to apply to for those life skills and, and who have those life skills, etc., you need to be an organisation where they want to stay. And that's a, that's another level of complexity. Uh, maybe we're not going to have the answer. No, I know. I mean, there's a lot to do and there's a lot of things we can do. I mean, around looking at community creators. I mean, another thing I recognise is people think by doing this kind of cross-pollination work, you know, where you're bringing lots of people um, to be involved in, let's say it's an exhibition, that's not about minimising anyone else's expertise. So, you know... Yeah. I don't necessarily think it's healthy that one curator would work in silo on their own to put together an exhibition. It's that's a huge responsibility, um, and I think it's a it's a it, we also miss opportunities if it's only coming from the view of one person's research and one person's um, view of the world. And let's be clear, why were museums set up in the first place? I mean, the idea 
I think now most people in museums know that they're not neutral spaces. They are political spaces. They were set up with a political agenda. Um, so I think we should be clear about that, that, that they, they continue a political agenda. It's just that we want to make it a bit more of a social justice um, agenda. Hey, well, look, Zandra, I'm, I'm uh, looking at the time. It's, it's always great speaking to you. We've got about 15 minutes left. So, uh, like I said, we can continue our conversation on many occasions. I see there's about 66 messages in the chat. I'm hoping they're all positive. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, look, are we going to be open to some? Uh, are you going to be okay to, to maybe? Yeah, uh, let's, let's answer some questions. Yes, I'm just thinking the best way of doing that. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to, uh, if, I don't know if anybody wants to, to throw them out there, uh, Tanya or Dana, or, or shall I just go through the chat and? And oh, there's a question here. Can I answer this question? Because I think this is a great ahead. question. Do yeah, you yeah. think the Black History Month will ever end and, and we can then have 12 months a year of British history where all aspects of history, no matter race, it's, it becomes the norm? I hope in my lifetime that happens. While I coordinated Black History Month, I never agreed with the, the concept that one month of the year was used to bring um, to light our, our connected history. However, as an activist and as a campaigner, I used it as a tool in Scotland to get us where we are in Scotland, actually, to recognise our history and, and, and you know, to recognise Scotland's involvement in empire and colonialism and the slave trade, you know? So love that question because I look forward to the day that we no longer need a Black History Month. I hope it happens in my lifetime. Yeah, well, I'll follow up on that as as well. We get, often get asked that that question. I agree with what you've said, uh, Zandra, there. But again, I like to think of myself as a pragmatist. And, and all I can say from personal experience that you know, I'm still asked to give the odd talk in Black History Month for organisations or museums or in locations that, that have never engaged and, and know little mm -hmm. about even the basics of Black history. So because of that, you know, when, when we all get onto a, a level playing field, then I've begun great. It's embedded. We can move because that's the aim, isn't it? It's to embed this. It's to embed working practices. It's to embed knowledge. You know, British world history. Of course, that's you know that's Black history, and that's we we know that. But we're not there yet. So at the moment, yeah, I still think there's a place for it. Uh, but hopefully, we will be working towards ending uh, that. Now, there's a lot of questions here. If Zandri, if you see any, you dive in as well. I'm trying to go through see one here from paul who says can how how can museums assert themselves in terms of changing public policy um it's not that i have a, a definitive answer paul but what i would say and it goes back to what i said earlier about be, you know paying attention to society issues um i'm a big fan of evidence base um there's plenty of evidence to out there to show what the legacies of our history, British history is and how that impacts on present day. And I would suggest, particularly with what you are having to deal with in England, actually, um, with current um, government policies, is keep pushing and keep putting forward the, the evidence of the history and how that impacts on present day and keep pushing that. Um, when you talk about your audiences, don't just talk about the people that are walking through your door. You know, your audience, you want to bring everybody in, in you know, who lives in a city or visits a city or whatever. Um, so look at the, the, the wider societal issues and try and use that to push forward um, the, gen the agenda that you have to tell the unvarnished truth. Yeah, I mean, agree with everything there. I'd just say that, you know, museums and the sector need to be at the, at the right tables. You know, we know how important we are for many of the reasons we've talked about. And I think we, we have, if we get it right in our sector, then we can offer other sectors and outside organisations advice on, on how they can be going to be more diverse or be more uh, inclusive. And, you know, policies are made at the very highest levels and museums need to be at that, that need to be at that table. Uh, I'm just going through the Q and A's. First of all, uh, hello to everyone who said hello. I mean, there's, there's loads, so sorry we've missed all them. Uh, question here from, uh, I think it's from Catherine. Uh, welcome. I would really welcome an overview from both speakers on the priority projects that 
the focus on this year in Glasgow and Liverpool. I'll kick off because my uh, I've mentioned it already. So uh, we've just uh, submitted uh, uh, NHLF uh, Horizons bid, and hopefully that will be successful to move us forward for our major capital project. So developing the Dr. Martin Luther King building, making it the front door of the Slavery Museum. At the moment, we, we're on the third floor of the of the Merseyside Maritime Museum, our you know, sister museum. Uh, but we need our own entrance and we would like to connect those buildings so we'd have more display space, display space more of those spaces like you were talking about, Zandra, uh, where people can be yeah, uncomfortable, I suppose, as well, but you can equally be creative. So, so that's where me, my team and colleagues at NML have been. And uh, in the next few years, if we're successful, ISM will be the gateway to the, to the Liverpool waterfront. And also a lot of the issues that we deal with at ISM will be issues that we will deal with as an organisation. You know, we're part of National Museums Liverpool and there's, and there's a lot of great work takes place at the other museums. It's not, not just ISM at all. So that's why I can say your good self. Um, it's interesting. That's a great question, actually. There's two questions. I'll try and answer both. The first part of the question, you know, you're asking what are the priority projects that you're focusing on. It's really been interesting for me. I'm six months in, in post, and if someone had said to me, Zandra, you're going to get your dream job at the Hunterian, but you're not actually going to get access to the collection. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's kind of like I've been offered this amazing opportunity um, to, to work in a, change, you know, a changing museum, but actually you can't really get into focus on what you really want to do because a big part of the work that I want to try and do is bring, you know, is to, to bring community to be at the centre of what we actually want to do going forward. Um, and the second part of the question, have you encountered any resistance to your work? All the time. You know, it, it's been really interesting seeing how the conversations have been going on for the last year. You know, I, I should point out that the, the role that I'm in was put together um, before the Black Lives Matter um, protests and before the death of um, George Floyd. So these conversations and these um, changing museum ide ideas have been happening in Scotland for quite a long time. But what I think is interesting is that resistance. It's there, but it's changed. You know, there is more doors opening. There is more people willing to sit around the table and have the, com the, the uncomfortable conversations. Um, so again, I'm going to end that positively because we have to, if we're not positive about this, we're not going to, what would be the point in continuing to try and achieve what we're trying to achieve? Well, absolutely, isn't it? And, and you know, I'm, a, I'm from a big organisation and, and the will is absolutely there. And I think if people are, are willing to, to learn and educate themselves, then that's a hell of a good start. And I've never been one to kind of castigate people whatsoever. It's about trying to be supportive uh, of, of to them and it look and maybe i've been fortunate but in in liverpool and you know ism is the result of, of as i alluded to many many years of activism and work by particularly members of the black community for, for decades uh, before leading up to the transatlantic slavery gallery in ism and you know great figures sadly the late dorothy kuya eric lynch there's there's too many people to to, to mention here and they're really not setting you up to fail. Why would they be? I mean, they don't, they don't disagree. They don't agree with everything we do and they're great critical friends. But I always say to people that it's not on us and them. I mean, I've always really attempted to be incredibly open and, and them see me as a person and not just the head of the museum. Likewise, my colleagues and, and in the ISM team and beyond. And like I said, people might disagree, but they don't want it to close. They want it to expand and be better. So I've always been very fortunate and it's always been, I've always been very, very proud to be ahead of ISM and I've always really welcomed the support that I've had from not just colleagues, but from members of the community and the activists and the historians. And That's the, back to what we're saying, you know, you're working with, with people, you know, and you're trying to fit in something that's all, you know, we're, we're working within an environment that are very oppressive structures and you're, you're trying to make a change without actually addressing the oppression that, that exists in the structures. And I think that's where a lot of resistance comes is you're trying to be um, a change of museum, for instance, 
but actually not addressing the structures that make that change really difficult. And I think that's where a, a, a lot of resistance comes from. I think a lot of resistance also comes from language. You know, people are comfortable now using a term like decolonisation, but they're not comfortable using terms like white supremacy. And you can't actually talk about decolonisation without talking about whiteness. Yeah, as well. And that, you that know, be there's yeah. always a resistance. So, so, you know, throughout my life, I've always seen the resistance to actually calling it what it is. So they like to find another word that makes it a wee bit more palatable. Yeah, no, I, I'm just looking, there's, I think, one more time for one more question, Sandra. We, 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 not doing badly, we've got five minutes. I think we're perfectly on time. There's one here from, from Nigel, and it says, uh, the, the last one, it's easy to see how this is practical in the large institutions. However, Considering a lot of museums are local history ones run by volunteers, how realistic is it that most museums can actually get involved in rectifying the inequalities in their collection stories? I will answer this two ways very quickly. One, go out and ask and seek partners who will be able to, more than happy to work with you on something. I can only cite myself and I'm sure Zandra as people that if anybody ever did contact us, we would be there willing to, to work with them in any way. And just going back to my first point, it's educating themselves, you know, especially if you're in an area where it isn't diverse whatsoever, lead the way, go out there, find out what things mean. And if you don't need help and assistance, it will be there. I also think a very important point and um, to put forward to Nigel is also, I'd be curious what it means about how people can you know, get involved in rectifying inequalities. Let's be clear here, when we talk about equality, we are talking about everybody. You know, we all, we all have identities. We all, you know, the legislation, for instance, around equality is for everyone. So it's people that are making up a museum. So the responsibility to address inequalities impact on the people who work in that museum also. So. When we talk about equalities, I think we have to be careful. We're talking about all of us. We're not talking about a group over there. It means everyone. Um, so I would approach it like that in your museum, Nigel, in the, in the smaller museums, you know. It's people that run them, and therefore they should and can be involved in addressing inequality. Well, Zandra, I'm looking at the time. I think we've got to end it there. Uh, end it there. Can I say it's been great? As always, chatting to you and for you giving your time for those people that maybe. I hope it wasn't it too boring for everybody. You and I just chatting as we do. Right? No, no. We'll ignore those. We'll like, if it is, <laughs> I'll ignore those chats and those comments. We'll just look at the good ones, right? Uh, but look, it's been great speaking to you. And uh, all I can say to people who are listening to this, do drop us a line afterwards. I'm happy to answer any follow up questions uh, that Catherine and Tanya and the team can can pass on. So. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. And then, uh, so I think we're going to be cut off uh, and, and back to uh, Dana and Catherine and Tanya. So thanks, Zandra. I'll catch Bye. up with you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Zandra and, and Richard. And I think I can say on behalf of anyone that was most definitely not boring. Uh, it was it was a brilliant discussion. So so thank you. Um, you between you identified some really constructive and, and timely challenges for us uh, in museums. I think about the need to relinquish control, um, about how we need to make a really conscious effort to be anti-racist in everything we, we do, um, how we need to focus on the issues that actually matter in society rather than getting very caught up in our own museum business and, uh, and issues. Um, and also about that really important move from statements and symbolism to, to actual sustained action uh, in, in our practice. Um, so thank you everyone who has joined us for this session. Um, we're now going to move to a 20 minute uh, coffee break um, and then we'll return at half past 11 uh, where our next session will be live from Queer Britain um, where we'll all have an opportunity to hear a bit more about creating the UK's first LGBT plus museum. Thank you.